This morning, uh, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. We have been, uh, for the last uh, ten or so weeks, we've been preaching a series called The Story of the Gospel. And uh, we've just been going through uh, all four Gospels uh, step by step through the the story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, Now, we are in the, the Bible Belt, on the buckle of the Bible Belt down here. And what's true of where Brother Fisher is going in Alaska is probably not true here Uh, Most everyone in this area knows the story of the gospel. They know that Jesus uh, was born of a virgin. They know the Christmas story. But then they know the Easter story. They know that he died and rose again. But believe it or not, there's a lot more to the story of the gospel than just the fact that Christ died and rose again. There are several details and and just steps throughout the entire gospel. And we've been focusing on those uh, for the last several weeks. We started... Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we call the Garden of Grief. Uh, If you were with us that week, and we went through Jesus praying in agony there in the Garden of uh, of Gethsemane and uh, and submitting to the will of God to die. And we saw some wonderful truth there in the Garden of, uh, of Grief. And then from there, He was led to the palace of the high priest, which we call the Palace of Perjury. We called it the Palace of Perjury because they perjured themselves. They lied and and sought false witness against Christ. And they had an illegal trial and and illegally charged him with crimes that he never did commit. And uh, there was a lot of great truth we found in the Palace of Perjury. And then from there he was led to Pilate's Hall, which we call the Hall of Humiliation. And it was there where Christ was completely humiliated. Uh, he was mocked and, uh, and, and, and betrayed and he was beat on and spit on and it was, it was a humiliating uh, event. We, we were there for three weeks. We first saw the sinners in the hall of humiliation and we saw the three different types of sinners that are on the earth that were all there uh, in the hall of humiliation. And then we saw the Savior in the hall of humiliation and we pointed out how Jesus Christ was exactly where he was supposed to be at that precise moment. And we noted all the prophecies that he fulfilled just in that brief couple hours at the Hall of Humiliation. And then we saw the substitute at the Hall of Humiliation. Most people are familiar with the fact that Jesus died next to two thieves. And there was supposed to be a man in the middle of them named Barabbas, but Jesus was his substitute and died in his place. And and we can all say amen that Jesus died in my place. And from there they led him out to Calvary, to Golgotha, which we call the road to redemption, the road to redemption. And we were there for three weeks as well, and we first saw on the road to redemption as Christ carried His cross to go be crucified. An amazing little event takes place. A man named Simon from Cyrene was, was apprehended and, and was allowed the opportunity to help carry the cross with Jesus Christ. We saw that and received a great blessing from it. Uh, and then on that road to redemption, if you remember, there was a group of women that were there And they were weeping and wailing loudly. And Jesus, he had ignored everybody as a lamb before her shears was dumb, so opening not his mouth. But he decided to speak to them. And he addressed those weeping women. And we looked at the last sermon Jesus gave before dying. And also there was a lot of truth in that. And then we saw the end of the road. Christ did get to Calvary and those two thieves that were with him. And there he was crucified. And then a couple weeks ago, we saw the title on the cross. The title on the cross. The title read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And we preached on those names found uh, for Jesus Christ. But this morning, I want us to look in the book of John, chapter 19. And I want us to see a special little side note that God chose to include in the Bible that He didn't have to, but I'm glad He did. And I want us to look at two verses, and I want us to see the garment of God. The Garment of God. If you've got your place, would you stand with us? We'll read a couple of verses. John chapter 19. If you're there, say amen. Amen. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His garments and made four parts. To every soldier, a part. And also His coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Would you pray with us? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for letting us come to church this morning. Thank you for all the ones that came. Thank you for our visitors. I pray that you speak to them in a special way. I pray you, uh, you speak to Calvary Baptist Church, all of the uh, people that are always here. I pray that you bless them uh, for coming. I pray that the, the message can uh, encourage them and touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. The garment of God. It is the faith-based position of this church and of this preacher that every word in your Bible is there on purpose. If God puts a side note in an, a chapter, it's supposed to be there. And uh, a good friend of mine says this all the time, that God has never used one word loosely. If God said it, He meant it. And so as we read these two little verses uh, about this, this garment, uh, as we read this, uh, it may seem insignificant. It may seem a, uh, a stretch. It may seem... Uh, a minute detail, but, but my God, He is the God of the details. And unlike anyone else, He can pack more truth into, a, into one sentence than anyone uh, in the universe. And remember, we're covering the details of the gospel. We're looking at it step by step, the, the small things that God has uh, placed in there. A lot of these details we have uh, focused on, and, uh, and be honest with you, and don't get upset, they do not add or take away from the truth of the gospel. Uh, the gospel story would remain the same if this, this, these verses about the clothes were not in there. The, uh, the statements that are made uh, when Christ was mocked uh, by those soldiers, when they, they put a crown of thorns on Him. You understand in the Old Testament there is absolutely no prophecy about a crown of thorns. It did not have to happen. He did not have to wear that. That did not have to be there. It does not change the truth of the gospel. Jesus could have died without it, and your sin would have been just as much paid for. But God added in all of these little details, and there is a lot of great truth in them if we just take a, a closer look. And, and I believe this garment of God is one such detail. And I believe if we'll look at it a little closely, that I believe God can speak to us and, and, and bless our heart. And, uh, and I hope that's why you came this morning. I hope you came to hear from God. If all you did was come to hear from me, you will be gravely disappointed. Uh, I am not a great preacher. Y'all could say amen. It's okay. I'm, I got thick skin. I am not a great preacher. I am not a great orator. I am not a great presenter. But I know a great God, and I have a great Bible. And so I hope you came to hear from God. And so the garment of God, in this garment that we've just seen in verse 23 and verse 24... We see both the glory of Christ and the shame of Christ. For you and me, the cross is the most glorious thing we know. The fact that God in the flesh died for our sin, that's the most glorious thing that you and I know. There's not a greater truth you can ponder on. Uh, Daniel Webster was asked, or Noah Webster, I'm sorry, was asked, he said, what is the greatest thought a man can have? And he said, the greatest thing a man can think about is that God died for him. And so the cross is the most glorious thing that we know, but also for Christ, it was the most shameful thing that he ever knew. I want us to notice first this morning the shame of the cross. The shame of the cross. In verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they had crucified Jesus. Now, crucifixion, thankfully, is very far removed from our culture. It is so far removed from our culture that you and I really know nothing of the shame of being crucified. You'll understand that Jesus was not the first or the last man to be crucified. You'll understand that. And the crucifixion was the most shameful thing that a human being could go through. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, Brother James, you can put that on the screen. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, say the next three words, despising the shame. Never forget how shameful it was for Christ to be crucified. Cicero, the Roman writer, said that it was the most cruel and horrifying death a human could die. Tacitus, a Roman historian, said that it was completely despicable. 
And I know we have ornate and beautiful crosses. The crosses in our building are, are attractive and are beautiful, and they mean something beautiful to us. But never lose sight of the disgust that would have been at Calvary. It was a shameful thing. In Deuteronomy 21, next verse, it says, If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. Why? For he that is hanged is accursed of God. He that is hanged is accursed of God. I'm telling you, Christ went through great shame when He was crucified. He was shamed. Have you ever been ashamed of something? Have you ever been ashamed of what you said, what you have done, or or what you have accidentally meant, or, or maybe you got caught doing something you didn't think you would get caught doing, and you know what it feels like to be ashamed, maybe even humiliated. You've been humiliated. And I am extremely thankful that Jesus died for my sins, but I'm also glad that He died for my shame. I'm glad that He died for my shame because there are times when I come before my God to confess a sin, and quite honestly, if you're okay with me being this way, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to confess the same sin a, a millionth time. I'm ashamed of failing God. I'm ashamed of not being what I ought to be. And I'm glad that Jesus died for my sin, but I'm equally glad that He died for my shame. Romans chapter 10 and verse 11, the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. You shall not be ashamed. And I'm thankful that Jesus died for my shame. The shame of His cross. But I want you to notice in our text in John 19, also the shame of His clothes. The shame of His clothes. The title of the sermon is The Garment of God. That is our focus this morning, or the clothes that Jesus was wearing. In verse 23, the soldiers crucified Jesus, and they took His garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also His coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment. This is Psalms chapter 22. They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did the shame of his clothes. Would you notice first this morning that his clothes were removed? His clothes were removed. Now you'll be very thankful that no one comes and removes your clothes while you're here today. You'll be really thankful about that. No one else wants that to happen either. Christ's clothes, they were removed. When your clothes have been removed, you are naked. You are naked. Your Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the world, died naked. They removed his clothes. Job 26 said, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. Christ was crucified, but he wasn't just crucified. They took his clothes from him. And I know in art you see paintings all the time, and, and I know being appropriate, they, they, will, they will put some type of uh, cloth or uh, covering on his body for certain areas, and I understand that. And I, 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 get, the, I, I, I get it, I, being trying to be appropriate. But you understand Jesus Christ... He died in absolute shame. He died completely naked with nothing on His body. Destruction hath no covering. And when we read this, that His clothes were removed from Him, we cannot help but think of the Garden of Eden. I cannot help but think of Adam and Eve. God made them in the garden in the book of Genesis, and they were naked and they were not ashamed, Genesis says. They were not ashamed, they were naked. But then something happened. You all know the story. Satan came into the garden. He deceived Eve. And Eve took of the fruit of the forbidden tree. She gave it to her husband. He took of that fruit. And sin entered into their hearts. Sin entered into the world. You know what the Bible says? It says their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. They were ashamed. They were ashamed. And so then God starts to come to the garden to come and speak with them, as He always did. And Adam and Eve had hid themselves. They had taken fig leaves and sewn them together to make themselves aprons to cover up this this nakedness, to cover up this shame. And and then God starts coming, and they they become afraid, and so they go and hide. And and God says, Adam, where art thou? Where art thou? And, And Adam says, I hid myself because I was naked. I was afraid. He was naked. He was afraid. Do you understand that they had always been naked? But they had, when God made them, they were naked. But they were not ashamed. Do you understand that there was nobody new in the garden? I mean, it was Adam and Eve, and that was it. So there was no random person that, you know, they just, oh man, I'm not covered. You know, they were trying to hide from. 
It was just Adam and Eve. But all of a sudden now, without the connection to God, now they're ashamed of what they were. They're ashamed of what they've always been. They're ashamed of what they've done. And they feel that they have to cover themselves. And can it be any coincidence that that Jesus Christ, as He was dying on the cross, died just like Adam found Himself? As Jesus is dying for sin, He dies the exact same way Adam found Himself. The very first sinner, Adam and Eve, found themselves naked and Christ dies naked. Yes, He died for our sins, but I'm telling you, brethren, He died for our shame. His clothes were removed. But I want you to notice in verse 23, his clothes were not just removed. These clothes were rare. These clothes were rare. The soldiers, they they took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. And and so I'm sure one soldier, uh, they began to divide them up. And I'm sure one soldier got his sandals. Uh, I'm sure one soldier got the headpiece. And one got the tunic. And I'm sure one got that sash belt thing that ties everything together. But, But then there was this coat. Then there was this coat. They took his coat also, and now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Who shall be this? Don't tear that. That's a, that's a high-quality garment. Let's not rend that thing. It doesn't have a seam anywhere through it. It's all one solid piece woven from the top throughout. Let's not mess that up. That's a great piece of clothing. Don't tear that. It was a, it was a rare piece. And... And so these soldiers, as they began to divvy up the clothes, they, upon taking a closer look, they noticed this one coat didn't have any seams in it. They took a closer look and examined what they had in their hands from Christ, and they, they realized that in Christ's coat there was no seam. They were impressed. It isn't that always how it is with the Lord. The closer you look at Him, the more things you find you're impressed The closer you look at Jesus, I don't know if anyone in here here this morning, the closer you look at Jesus, the more things you find that are impressive. The closer you look at Christ, the better He becomes. Maybe you walked in here with a distant view of Jesus, maybe thinking He's just another, uh, another, another good man, another religious name on the list of people we're supposed to pray to. But let me tell you something, the closer you look at Jesus, the more amazed you find yourself. And in Him, there's no seam. The closer we look, the more wonderful things we find in Jesus. And as these soldiers looked at this coat, they were impressed and and they found something out that they didn't know before. You know, clothes say a lot about a person, don't they? Clothes say a lot about a person. You know, like those people that wear pajamas to Walmart. (laughs) That that says something about them. That says they're lazy. That's what it says. It says they're lazy. It says they don't care about Walmart. They don't care about the people in Walmart. You know nobody wants to see that. I don't, I don't want to see your dirty pajamas. You don't want to see mine. Leave them at home. Amen? But clothes say a lot about a person. Clothes say a lot about a person. And so this garment of God, what did it say about the person? What did, what did this coat, this, this seamless coat, with, with this woven from the top throughout with no seam in it, what did the garment of God say about him? His clothes were removed, his clothes were rare, but his clothes were representative. They represented some things about his person. And there are a few representations that I would like to bring to you this morning right fast before we go any further, because I want you to know them about Jesus Christ. I want you to know them about him. First off, as they looked at this coat, they realized there was no seam in it. That that means there was not two pieces of fabric sewn together to make one. That's how all of our clothes are this morning. This coat has many seams on it. It was not just one piece of fabric. It was many pieces that were sewn together, just like your pants or your dress. It was sewn together. Many pieces are brought together to make one. And in any garment, when, a, when there's a seam there, that is the weakest point of that garment. The, Where two pieces become one, that's the weakest point of that garment. If it's going to tear, it's going to tear right there. Now, I'm going to need a good amen right here just to make sure I know everyone's still awake. Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. That means two parts. There's two parts to Jesus. And so you would think somewhere, Brother Doug, there would be a seam. Somewhere where humanity and divinity were sewn together, there would have to be a seam somewhere. There would have to be a weak point somewhere or somewhere where His God side and His man side 
were brought in together. First Timothy says it best, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I don't profess to be able to explain it the best way, but I do believe that Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. But there was no seam in his clothes because there was no seam in his person. He was 100% God, 100% man. Yes, there were two parts, but there was no seam in him. There was no, there was no weak point in him. There was no place for him to come apart. And you would think that there would be a seam somewhere. There would be a weakness somewhere, a, 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 a weak spot. There wasn't one. Even in Matthew chapter 4, when he was hungry, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan came looking for a seam to tempt him, but there was still no seam even when he was hungry. He was hated. He came into his own, but his own received him not. He told his disciples in John chapter uh, uh, 17, I believe it is, he said that when they hate you, you know they hated me first. As those soldiers gathered around him and they beat him, they punched him in the face, they blindfolded him and said, tell us who punched you, tell us who smote you. They spit in his face, they grabbed the beard and, and ripped it out of his face. Now how bad that would hurt. It'd be excruciating. And they hated him and they mocked him. But even as he was being hated, there was still no weakness in him. If you and I were treated such, we would retaliate as a man. Look, I'm saved, but I'm still a man. You spit in my face. I'm going to get unchristian real fast and probably sin. And Jesus Christ had ample opportunity to show that he was a man and, and fight back and retaliate, lose his temper and, and bring down fire and bring on every single one of them, but he didn't because there was just no seam. And even as he was hung on the cross, dying for sin, there was no seam in him. There was no weakness, no place for him to fall apart, no place for his God side and his man side to come unraveled. No seam in him. There was no weakness. The clothes also represent not just the weakness, but the, the work. They represent his work. Now, the only other time in Scripture that I know of where a garment like this is seen is in the book of Exodus, chapter 28. God uh, sets up the priesthood for Israel uh, with Aaron, Moses' big brother. Y'all remember Aaron, the, the first priest and, uh, of Israel. And when God set this priesthood up, uh, He gave Moses very specific and detailed instructions about the clothes these priests was to wear. They had a specific garment they were going to wear. And, and this garment was just like the one that is described about Christ. It was a seamless garment woven from the top throughout with no seam in it. And so this garment with no seam, it is a, it is a priest's garment. It is a priest's garment. Now, so as we look at Christ, now we know Hebrews chapter 4 says that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Amen for that. And so as we look at this garment that Jesus is wearing... Uh, it's his work garment. He's our priest. That's his job. You all understand priest was an occupation, just like pastoring is an occupation. Priest was an occupation. And, and I, think, I think our American culture has a, a lot lost the meaning of, of priest. Uh, our, we just kind of take it as someone set aside to, uh, to do something in church or, do, or, or pray or whatever, and we kind of leave it at that. But, but, but priest, it means much more than that. The Latin form of it is priest. Pontifex, pontifex. I know we don't speak Latin, thank God, but uh, that's where the word comes from. And you know what it means? It means bridge builder. It means bridge builder. And so a priest, thank you, Brother Stephen, is a bridge builder. Look, if you haven't got anything this morning, I want you to get this. A priest is a bridge builder. What do bridges do? They make connections. One thing to another, and, and they allow people access to get from one thing to another. They don't just connect two things. They allow people access to get from point A to point B. That's what a bridge builder is. That's what a priest is. He is a bridge builder from man to to God, not just connecting the two. Job said, oh, that there were a daysman, someone that could put their hand on God, put their hand on me, and, and, and know the two, someone that could connect us, but not just a connection from man to God, but someone who can allow access for man to get to God. 
It's a bridge builder. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is called our forerunner. Our forerunner. So what is a forerunner? It is someone that prepares a way for somebody else to get there. John the Baptist was the forerunner. Jesus Christ was the forerunner. He took the blood of himself straight to God so that we could follow him in there. The bridge builder. So he's our priest. So as we look at this seamless robe, this, this robe that uh, had no seam woven throughout, it is his priest's garment. Hey, it's his work uniform. Some of you men and ladies know a lot about wearing a uniform to work. It's his work uniform. He's a priest. This, these clothes represent the weakness. They represent the work. But a little, little thing I noticed that I thought would be a blessing to you was it also represents his worth. His worth. Now, when Jesus was put on trial, he was put on trial by the high priest. His name was Caiaphas. Maybe you're familiar with this. And when Jesus Christ was on trial, his, his claim to be the Son of God offended this high priest Caiaphas so much that in Mark chapter 14, he grabbed his seamless robe, his priest's garment, and he ripped it. He ripped it. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is Levit Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 10, there was a law for those priests. Never rend your garment. When you rend your garment, you've disqualified yourself from being priest. And in the book of Acts, Caiaphas chapter 4 is not the high priest. Annas is the high priest. So what happened? He lost his job. Caiaphas got so upset in the trial of Christ... And he rent his garment, made himself unworthy, disqualified himself, and was no longer allowed to be priest. And so later after everything was over with Jesus and, and he, was, he died and they got that finished, they had to make a new high priest. There's got to be a high priest. They've got to have one. And so they made Annas the high priest. He lost his job. So do you know what that means? That means when Annas ripped his garment, or Caiaphas ripped his garment, when Jesus was on trial, he disqualified himself from being priest. So there was no worthy priest except Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was hung on a cross to die for sin, He was the only one worthy to build a bridge from man to God. He was the only one worthy to get God's attention. He was the only one worthy to make a blood sacrifice. Glory to God for a worthy, perfect high priest named Jesus. When a man disqualifies himself, when man fails, when man is inadequate, Jesus is adequate. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is our high high priest. What a blessing. What a blessing for the high priest. Hebrews chapter 4 says it best, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us hold fast our profession. Jesus. We see the shame in His clothes, the shame on His cross. But I want you to notice lastly, Miss Leslie, you can go ahead and make your way to the piano if you can lead us in uh, in a song. I want you to notice not just the shame of his cross and the shame of his clothes, but what these soldiers are doing, gambling, gambling for his robe, gambling for those clothes. Now, this is not a message on gambling, but I would say that's not a wise practice. But what these men are, what these men are doing is they're just taking chances on getting a part of Jesus. They're just taking chances. Not just the shame of the cross and the shame of his clothes, but notice the shame of their chance. The shame of their chance. They're taking a, a risk, taking a gamble. I mean, it was a shame that Christ was stripped naked. It was a shame that he was placed on a cross to die for sinners. But it is a complete and utter disgusting shame that these men are just taking a chance on getting some of Jesus. Jesus was very clear he did this on purpose. In John chapter 10, I believe it is, or maybe it's chapter 14, he said that no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down to myself. Jesus was there because he wanted to be. It's a shame that he had to die, but that had always been the plan. Hanging on a cross for sinners was always the plan. Jesus knew what he was doing. It was a shame that he had to die, but it was a shame that these men are just taking a risk and gambling on Christ. 
Christ did all of this on purpose. These men are flippantly casting lots, rolling the dice, rock, paper, scissors, shoot, to see who got the coat of Jesus. Surely that wouldn't be you this morning. Surely you're not taking a chance on Christ. Surely you wouldn't leave eternity up to chance. Surely yours is not a I hope I make it kind of thing. John said, these things have I written that ye may know that you have eternal life. Let me tell you something. September 22nd, 2006, I knelt down in the office of a good dear friend of mine, Judson Mitchell. You know what happened? I got saved. I trusted Christ as my Savior. I confessed my sin and I begged His forgiveness to save my soul. And you know what? I'm not taking a chance on whether or not I'm going to heaven. I don't have a hope so, maybe so kind of thing. For the bow, I know so. I know so. It's not a roll of the dice. It's not a roll of my good works. It's not a how hard can I try? How good can I be? How faithful to church can I do? How, how, how impressive can I be? How good of a citizen can I be? And I hope I get in. No, friend. It's not a hope so salvation. It is a no so salvation. I hope today you're not taking a chance on Christ. I hope today you're not leaving it up to the roll of a dice, the roll of good deeds. I hope you're not leaving it up to, well, my grandpa said, my grandmother said. I hope you're not leaving it up to that. I hope you're not leaving it up to, well, I think I did it right, back such and such. I think I said the right thing on such and such a day at such and such a church. I hope you're not leaving it up to chance. I hope that everyone in this room knows 100% without a shadow of the smallest doubt, you know you're saved. You know that you're going to heaven. If you died right this moment, you say, oh, here he goes. Here the preacher goes on the, on the scare tactic if you died right this moment. Well, if you died right this moment, where would you go? Do you have a definitive answer? Do you know? Do you know? Brother Charles Souls, do you know? You know it, don't you? That's, you don't hope so. You don't wake up wringing your hands saying, man, I hope I can be good enough today. I'm going to go to church. If the preacher asks me to pray, I'm going to pray real good. I'm going to do my best to be a blessing to all these visitors. And I hope God blesses that and I can get to go to heaven. You didn't wake up like that way, did you? You woke up knowing you was going to heaven. I woke up knowing I was going to heaven. Brother Williams, you wake up knowing you was going to heaven. You're taking a, I don't have no dice to roll. I don't have no lots to cast, no rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I ain't got nothing of that. I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. Friend, what do you know about eternity? What do you know about eternity? Don't be like these four Romans taking a chance. You know what they were taking a chance on, though? Who got it? Thinking, well, only one can get it. Only one will be lucky enough. Listen, there are, Jesus didn't die for the lucky. He died, 1 John chapter 2, for the sins of the whole world. You know what that means? Are you on the world? You in the world? Anyone on the world this morning? That means you're lucky enough Christ died for you. He died for you. Don't take a chance on Christ. The garment of God... I believe, preaches to us a truth. Don't gamble on eternity. Don't gamble on Jesus. Jesus Christ said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. Don't gamble on Jesus. Don't gamble on Jesus. Let's stand to our feet this morning. There's a simple verse we're about to pray and have a moment of invitation and sing. Before then, I want to I give you a simple verse. Maybe you've heard it before. But in the book of Romans, in chapter 10 and verse 13, he said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to be lucky enough. You don't have to be part of the chosen. You don't have to be part of the certain elect. You just have to be lost. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're going to have a song or a moment of invitation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I hope that God spoke to your heart this morning. And I want to give you an opportunity now. 
If you came here this morning not knowing, you can know today. You can go home. You can go to lunch at the Mexican restaurant or the buffet. You can go knowing you're safe. You can know that this morning. If I can get a few altar workers with their Bibles to come down. We've got some people, Miss Tammy, Brother William, y'all can come down. We've got some folks with their Bible. If, if you would like to pray with somebody, Brother Jonathan, if you don't mind coming down, if you don't mind, help us out. If you've never been saved, you can be saved this morning. We've got some folks that can help you pray. You say, oh, I'm too scared to go down there. You don't have to come down here. You can pray in your seat. You can pray in your seat. You say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. Let me tell you how I got saved. This is, what I, this is what I told God. This is so simple. I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being a sinner. And I confessed my faith in his death, burial, and resurrection and asked him to save me. And he did it. There are, there are no magic words. There's no magic spell. But simple humility and faith coming to Christ. Knowing you're a sinner. And trusting him for your forgiveness. Miss Leslie, go ahead. If you know it, sing it with her. been there a thousand years. 